Hello, in today's video we are going to demonstrate and discuss um, a 1965 Epiphone Zephyr model EA15RVT. Uh, in the process of this discussion and demonstration we will also talk about a couple of easy mods uh, that we can apply to this model uh, to make it sound better. Um, later Gibsons um, from the mid to late 60s are usually notorious for being somewhat thin um, and actually I mean when you when you just look at them in isolation they don't seem thin uh, it's only when you really play them against equivalent fenders of the time or ampegs or any other amp that they uh, that their thinness sorts uh, starts to become apparent um, and there are a couple reasons for this thinness and we'll get into that uh, a little bit and talk about some of the modifications that we can make uh, to one of these to improve them vastly. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, uh, stick around and uh, we'll talk more about that. Okay, this example of the Epiphone Zephyr um, has two channels. Uh, channel one has guitar and accordion inputs, uh, loudness control, bass and treble. Channel 2 has a guitar and accordion input as well. Loudness number 2 control, bass, treble, reverberation, and here is our tremolo with depth and frequency. We have a monitor output, a, an AC switch with reverse polarity positions. Uh, here is our indicator light, our 2 amp fuse. This uh, amp also comes with a foot switch uh, for tremolo and reverb. The serial number on this one is 820825 if anyone out there is counting. Uh, this obviously is a very, very clean example. A lot of times when you get these old Epiphones, uh, the faceplate, because it faces upward and, and God knows where they were stored, um, they, they have a tendency to, to uh, rust quite a bit. This one has a couple small uh, little spots, but uh, other than that, it's really pristine. Um, these amps uh, a lot of times had a, a Gibson counterpart, um, as I mentioned before. This particular model does not seem to have any exact Gibson GA series counterpart. Um, and let's let's actually take a look at um, uh, at some other examples of amps that it's close to, and we'll see why it's different. Here's a book um, that anyone into Gibson amplifiers uh, should really own. This is called uh, Gibson Amplifiers from 1933 to 2008, 75 years of the gold tone. Uh, it's written by Wally Marks Jr. Um, and if you don't already have a copy of this uh, and you're into Gibson amps, uh, I suggest you get a copy. There's a lot of good information in here. Uh, but what we're interested in today mainly is the section, uh, the chapter on Epiphones. Not a whole lot of information on the Epiphone models in particular in this book, uh, but there is there are a couple pages. Um, the page that is presented here does have a catalog page from 1965, uh, according to the book. Um, and the Zephyr uh, is displayed here, and I don't know if we can see that or uh, too clearly or not. Let's zoom in. Uh, we can see the catalog page here, and the Zephyr um, that is presented in this catalog is not the same as the one that we have here. Gibson is, was notorious for changing their models around, for fiddling with um, schematics, for putting things... Uh, changing components on a whim. So if you look at a schematic for an amplifier, you know, nine times out of ten, maybe, um, you know, it won't even be uh, exact to the schematic uh, from the factory even. So, um, you know, they weren't really that consistent with their models. And this is another example of that. Here is the Zephyr. Uh, here we see their entire line, the pacemaker, um, the, let's see, we have the pacemaker, the uh, Galaxy, the Devon, uh, I believe this is the Rivoli, and here is our Zephyr. Um, it looks like our channel one on our Zephyr here has a control for loudness. Our channel two has a control for loudness as well. And uh, it looks like they share a tone knob uh, between the two channels on this one. And then you do have the reverb tremolo uh, on channel two here. But um, a markedly different uh, tone stack 
uh, in this example of in the catalog um, than the one that we actually have in front of us here. Again, I've only seen a, a couple of pictures of a, of an Epiphone Zephyr online. Um, so they seem to be pretty rare amps. Um, the Epiphone Zephyr is a uh, 210 combo. Um, I don't know what, uh, th this is impossible to read the specs, so I don't know what, uh, what this had in it, whether it was 210s or 112 or what, but it looks like it might be a 210 amplifier also, but they definitely did something different with the tone stack at one point. And again, uh, th this book, um, you know, it's a, it's a great buy if you're into Gibson amps. It does come with the entire uh, Gibson amplifier service manual on CD-ROM. Uh, so you're able to look at all the schematics that at least were available. Uh, a lot of the Epiphone schematics are not going to be in there because, frankly, most of the Epiphone designs were copies of the of the Gibsons anyway. Um, but this one, again, I couldn't find an exact copy uh, of a Gibson. The closest that we came um, to finding a schematic uh, was this one. And let's get zoomed in on it. Uh, this is a schematic for uh, a Gibson GA35RVT, which is also known as the Lancer. Uh, there are some differences between the Lancer and this Zephyr. Um, namely, there is a tone stack on the, uh, on the second channel that was not existent uh, in the Zephyr that we see in front of us. Uh, none of these components were here. Um, if they had have been, I probably would have removed them. But what they had in this position instead was a .002 microfarad uh, cap to ground um, after this loudness control on the reverb channel. Um, another d distinct difference in this is that the GA35 RVT has eight tubes, whereas uh, the Zephyr we have before us only has seven tubes. Um, the J35 had an OA2 tube in this position um, and I believe that is a voltage regulator tube. Um, not sure why they saw fit to put that in in this model but um, it seems to be somewhat extraneous because they've made a decent amp with, without it so um, I'm not sure anyone would miss that. Um, there are some other differences as well in this uh, on the reverb channel there is a um, 0.0042 uh, microfarad cap uh, before the grid uh, this in the example we have is a 0.002 uh, microfarad cap um, same same with channel one that that value is different um, also uh, we have a 0.01 coupling cap uh, after the first stage here. Uh, in the schematic we have for the 35, it is it was supposed to be a, a 0047 um, microfarad. So that's different. Um, this first uh, tone stage, or uh, first tone network rather, um, this has been removed. Um, I've taken all of this out. Um, let's see. I've added a 33 microfarad uh, bypass cap here, whereas I think before it was only a, it was only like a two microfarad or something like that. Uh, that's beefed up um, the output from this first stage considerably. Uh, I've done the same thing down here. I've added a 25 on this on the second channel, uh, whereas there it was. Um, Again, something really small. Like I've, I've written over it, but I think it was a point. Uh, I think it was a, like a. I think it was a two microfarad, something like that. Um, here, instead of a 750k resistor, uh, we have a 78k. Um, actually, that's not correct. Um, that was a note I made when I was going to try to replace all of uh, this tone network. Now what I ended up doing instead was leaving this in and the reason I left this in is because with this out, with the change that we made here uh, and the, beef, the beefed up 
um, tone that we're sending, signal that we're sending through as a result of that, and the removal of this uh, tone network to remove this one as well actually gave us uh, way too much gain leading into this final stage. And what it was doing was it was actually it was starting to uh, distort on the highs, and that was gonna I was gonna have to put in a negative feedback um, to try to correct that. Um, and do and do some other things to actually try to limit the signal that was coming in here anyway. And at the end of the day, that's that's what this tone network was doing. So I decided to just leave that in as as opposed to trying to replace it and then replace it with a bunch of other measures that were essentially doing the same thing. So it made more sense to just remove this tone network and leave the second one in uh, for this particular uh, mod. Um, these resistors um, to this screen. Here uh, were changed from a 1K to a 500 ohm value, um, and that is pretty much the only changes uh, that I have made to this to this amp. Uh, the I did find whenever I was playing it, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, in a little bit when we look at the guts. Um, but I did find when I was playing it that, uh, that I was getting a lot of pops and cracks whenever I would hit like low notes um, and I traced that down to a problem with the uh, with the tremolo and uh, we'll get a little better look at that in just a moment. Here's the back of the amp and um, one thing we notice about the, the back of the amp um, is that you know there's a, there's a big panel uh, covering it and that's one thing I don't really like about this uh, because the tubes the power tubes that are in here are 7591s and they generate quite a lot of heat um, and this is not a design that's really conducive uh, to heat dissipation um, really you need some ventilation for for all that heat to come out back here but uh, all the heat's just basically coming up here and building up on the on the chassis so a lot of Epiphone amps, for that reason, um, will have pretty pretty hot uh, face plates whenever whenever they're on, and that's that's fairly usual uh, for some of the models. Uh, but let's take this back door off now and, and check out the uh, check out the insides. Okay, here we are with the back door off, uh, and we can see our tube complement. Uh, we have a six EU seven. Um, this, I believe, is a 12 AU7, a six, another 6 EU7. Uh, here we have another 12 AU7. Uh, way over here on this side is another 12 AU7. As you'll recall on the schematic, on the other side of, uh, or for the 35 RVT, that is, on the other side of the power tubes, we had uh, an OA2 um, tube. But our, in this one, our 12 AU7, our other 12 AU7 has been moved over to this position. Here are 7591 power tubes, and in this in this one we have a pair of Western Electric. Um, we have uh, one, two, three, four transformers on the outside. There's also a transformer on the inside, uh, as we'll we will also see. Um, our speakers are 10 inch uh, CTS uh, date coded. Five, 1965, the 29th week. Uh, here we have a date code of uh, 1965, the 22nd week. Um, let's see, here we have uh, a date code of 65, the 27th week on the power transformer. Um, all of our transformers are original, um, as is pretty much everything else, with the exception of the components that I changed in the servicing. Um, the Reverb tank, this is a Gibbs reverb tank. It's dated 1965, the 21st week. So everything pretty much fits firmly about the middle of 1965 for this um, as a build date. Um, but again, you know, we see those differences with, with the catalog and the difference is pretty stark when you think about it. I mean, they've added, they've uh, completely revamped the, the tone network uh, in this amp. Uh, as opposed to what it was in that catalog page. So, um, and again, with the absence of, a, of an exact schematic, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, um, you know, what may or may not have even been changed in the in the past. Uh, you know, you kind of have to look at 
components and look at the the quality of the soldering and, and those sorts of things to get an idea of what had or had not been changed or what was or was not original and um, you know with documentation kind of being scarce uh, on a lot of Gibsons due to their sort of you know second tier status in a lot of players minds um, you know these get relegated um, to the kind of who cares bin a lot of times and unfairly so uh, with a couple of slight tweaks these can be turned into amazing amps um, as, as we'll see, you know, this one's got a really good tone and um, let's take a look at the inside and uh, talk about it a little bit, what has been changed, what has been done there, and then we will move along to a, uh, uh, a demo with, of the tone. Actually, before we do that, one other thing I did want to point out uh, is the cabinet construction. Um, the, the entire cabinet, uh, by the look of it, is constructed of, of plywood. It's fairly thick plywood. It looks to be birch to me. Uh, even the baffle board uh, is plywood. Um, the only thing that appears to not be plywood is the back door. The back door is made of a particle board, um, which, you know, isn't a huge deal. If anything was going to be made of particle board, I would choose this. Um, but everything else seems to be pretty strong, uh, pretty fairly thick birch plywood. So uh, they haven't cheaped out on the on the cabinet, which, uh, which is good. Uh, they haven't cheaped out on the components. We got you know decent CTS uh, speakers um, that do sound great in this, uh, and we've got, I mean, four five transformers. Uh, so they weren't cheaping out on transformers either. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at the inyards. Okay, here we're going to take a look at the guts of the amp. Um, I apologize for having to do this in pictures, but um, this is what we're left with. I actually made a video and it got corrupted, so here we are. Um, you can see inside this one, everything is uh, fairly clean. I've uh, replaced a lot of the replaced a lot of the caps. As you can see over here, these are all the ones for the Tremolo, I believe, if I remember correctly. Uh, put a three-prong cord on it. All the electrolytics have been replaced. Uh, there's really no good place to put these electrolytics, unfortunately. Um, the, the best solution I can come up with is, is, to, um, uh, is to actually hot glue them up here along the chassis. To try to drill holes in the in the chassis was not gonna um, was not gonna be a good idea because this is all in the front um, and there's a lot of real all, pretty much all the real estate was being taken up back here as you can see but uh, uh, here are a few of the components let's see let's move along to the next photo move along one more uh, this is the first board uh, over on this side. Um, I kind of like actually the way these boards are um, are mounted uh, or the way the parts mount to the boards rather. Um, it's really easy to get things on and off of this because they're open-ended um, and the parts just slip in and out uh, pretty easily. Um, you can see here the beefed up uh, bypass capacitors that I put on the input stages. Um, changed the input resistor here. Um, to give it a little variation. Um, here is the um, here's the Tremolo Roach which has the light inside of it that flickers and the uh, the light sensitive resistor uh, the photosensitive resistor rather uh, also in there. Um, here's the tone network uh, you can see all this stuff hanging out here um, kind of in the air uh, this is uh, one of the tone networks that I pointed out, and actually the tone network that's here physically looks uh, looks to be even different than the one that's uh, pictured in the uh, GA35RBT schematic, so uh, that's different. Uh, you see here a couple other caps uh, that have been replaced. Um, here's another one down here that was replaced. Um, and most of this was in an effort just to make sure everything... Um, was properly serviced. Uh, here you get a better look at the uh, tone network uh, cap, caps and resistors. There's another shot of the uh, of the roach. Another cap that was replaced. Uh, this is the other board. Uh, a couple big power resistors here. Uh, those I believe are the um, the resistors that go to the 
screen grid. Um, another replaced component, uh, another one there. I think that one was replaced when I when I got this thing. Uh, all these caps here replaced. Another replaced uh, cap over there. Uh, replaced all the coupling caps in the amp uh, for the most part. So that's the uh, that's the inside. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing uh, that I did uh, were the were, was taking out that second tone network, uh, getting rid of that on the stage previous, um, and also uh, beefing up uh, the the early stage with those uh, capacitors um, and trying to hunt down the the, the pop that was occurring uh, whenever I would hit a low note um, was really easier said than done. Um, it was one of these little leads right here uh, and down inside you can't really see it so uh, you can't see the fact that it's in a, that the connector is just barely hanging on and that when you hit a low note it's causing that to, to move around and pop. Um, and it was hard to duplicate this because you would get in here with a chopstick and move things around and it wasn't necessarily doing it every time. You might move something over here that was just barely moving, uh, moving this component um, remotely and then it would it would make the pop so you'd misdiagnose it to some other part and um, you know just trying to track that down was a was a big pain in the ass to be to be quite honest but uh, once I finally got it tracked down it was pretty easy to replace now I could show you um, uh, components here that it, that were used to replace the, uh, the photoresistor and the light um, as a matter of fact let's see here are here are those components. Here is the original uh, roach that was in there, um, and this is uh, this is after I've stripped it down. I actually put uh, I made a couple of different ones in an effort to find the best combination of photoresistor. Um, here, speaking of photoresistors, here are the ones that you can buy. Uh, you can get these on eBay. Um, I'm sure you know Mauser and other places have them too. Probably Antique Electron Supply. Uh, but I chose eBay because you can get these direct from China and you can get a lot a lot of them so in the future I can kind of experiment um, with different values and things and different amps um, and and roll my own but this is what they look like um, you have a uh, a photosensitive um, resistor here on the end uh, that's that's sensitive to light uh, and you just basically take one of these little lamps and and here are the lamps that I used. Uh, you can get those at Mimotronics.com and they are uh, little neon lamps and the ones that I bought here actually came with a little resistor that you can run in series um, to protect your lamp. But what you do basically put these uh, end on end this way and uh, encase them in um, you know some shrink tubing something of that sort and then you end up with your tremolo roach um, you can again experiment with different values. I bought uh, I bought three or four different packages of 20, so I'll have plenty of these for the future. Um, and got different values so that they uh, you know may work with some amps and may may not work with others. But that'll give me some flexibility in the future to experiment. And you can get um, boxes of these lamps too fairly cheaply. Again, there's uh, there's the address memotronics.com. Uh, out of Houston, Texas, and there's their phone number and everything if you want some of these lamps. Um, but if you're making your own tremolos uh, or you're, you know, you do repairs on a lot of vintage amps with tremolo, uh, this, these are parts you should probably have. Uh, but yeah, let's check out uh, some of the tones of the amp. Okay, we finally got into the demo stage of this, and uh, we're, for the purpose of the demo, we're going to use a 1988 uh, Fender American Standard Telecaster. Uh, right now we're going into channel one into the guitar input. Uh, the loudness is a little over halfway, the bass is about halfway, and the treble is about at three o'clock or so. Thank you. 
will break up when you push it. if you use pedals uh, and you can always jumper these channels as well so you can come from the guitar over to here and you can have the best of both worlds but um, channel two a little little bit less gain a little less loud nice warm sound though Thank you. 
yeah, that is a 1965 Epiphone Zephyr model EA15RVT.